fears, the rocks that might hold us back from experiencing the light of Jesus and the life that you promised to give us. I ask you, Lord, that every word that you've placed in my heart to share will be one that peels off layer after layer in our hearts so that we can see you face to face deeper in a way that changes us forever and our families and our region for the glory of your name. And we all say, Amen. Amen. It's so good to have you here <clears throat> this morning on Easter Sunday. Um, my family is very thrilled to have been able to invite several neighbors and friends. And I thank everyone who invited somebody today. And we are grateful for everyone who accepted an invitation today. You made it to church on Easter Sunday. Give yourself a hand. Come on, that's good. That's a good place to be. You made it. That's awesome. So, for the next three hours, I'm going to try to explain to you the mysteries of the resurrection, the eschatology of the coming of Jesus. No, I won't go that far. But I want to read to you two accounts of Scripture. We're going to read the Scripture and I trust that the power of God would just begin to pierce through our hearts with these wonderful words written to us by the Gospels. The title of my message is Earthquake of Hope. Earthquake of Hope. I'm going to ask you to all please stand in, in reverence of the Word of God. And we're going to read accounts of Matthew 27 and chapter 28. You can follow along on the screen if you don't have your Bible, Matthew 27, and we'll start from verse 45. It says, at noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani, which means, my God. My God, why have you abandoned me? And then Jesus shouted out again. This is verse 50. And he released his spirit. Notice he released his spirit. He was in control of his life. Nobody took it from him. He gave it away. He was God giving up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two. From top to bottom, the earth shook. Rocks split apart and tombs were opened. Then on verse 54, the Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. And they said, this man truly was the son of man, the son of God. This was the crucifixion. Now let's go over to the resurrection three days later. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1 through 7, it says, Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The gods shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. And the angel spoke to the women, Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come, see where his body his, was lying. And now, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. Two accounts, church. Crucifixion and resurrection. And in both instances, there's, there was an earthquake. The earth shook. I'm talking about planet Earth. It wasn't just 
a lamp that shook. It wasn't just that, a little pebble next to the cross that shook. The whole earth shook at the crucifixion and at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You may take a seat right now, and I'm going to begin to unfold to you what this means for our lives today. I don't know if you've ever been in, a, in an earthquake, but an earthquake, from my experience, is the most terrifying thing that a human being can go through, especially if your house uh, is not well built because you have the risk of dying under the debris that will fall on you. I've been on several earthquakes in my life. If you've been ever in an earthquake, I want to see your hand. Not too many, but some of you. Um, back in 1983, where I was born, there was an earthquake that destroyed the whole city. I've shared this before. And I lost several family members. I lost cousins and aunts. It was a horrible, horrible experience. We felt that earthquake like miles away from the epicenter, but it was terrifying. I remember crying under a door frame, pleading for mercy. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you what makes you an instant believer. An earthquake would do that. You'll begin to cry out to the God you said you didn't believe on. You, you ask for mercy because it's, it's a, an incredible power and strength, and you cannot contain it. It says that the Roman officers that were crucifying Jesus when he let out his spirit and cried out to a loud voice, it says that the earth shook terribly, so strong that rocks split apart. I mean, that's a rock-splitting earthquake. It's got a lot of power. Tombs began to open. All over the cemeteries, every stone begins to be rolled. And the entry point has access now. Began to research, what is the weight of the human race? How much does the human race weight on planet Earth? 3.5 million tons. And if we would all jump at the same time on the face of the Earth, the Earth would probably shake a little. It would create a ripple effect. And now it says that there was an earthquake when Jesus died. And I wonder what in the world caused that event to produce an earthquake on earth. Because every time I've researched earthquakes, an earthquake causes death. But when's the first time that a dead person causes an earthquake? How is it that an event on the earth can cause an earthquake on the earth? Earthquakes generate events, not the other way around. But this one account of Jesus' death on the cross was so impactful in the spiritual realm that it was manifested in the physical realm. The death of Jesus triggered an earthquake, a physical manifestation of a spiritual reality. If you've ever gone through any sort of grief or pain, you know that the weight of that can shatter you, can break your bones. It can depress you. The weight of pain can actually lead you to death. Some of you could be holding the weight of depression, a loved one that has died. Maybe the betrayal of a friend. Maybe your spouse left you for somebody else. All of a sudden, there's the news that you have a disease that is terminal and, and your world changes. And, and, and not a physical, but an, but an inner earthquake begins to shake you inside. Deeply, and the heaviness of that torment can become strong. And you, you live long enough, you will find out that there will be pain and grief in this earth. We live in a fallen world. And live long enough, and you will find that somewhere, somewhere down the road, you will experience grief and pain. And it becomes heavy and heavy and heavy, heavier than your physical weight, heavier than the weight of the whole human race. Heavier than those 3.5 million tons that are standing on planet Earth. It's the weight of pain, the weight of sin, of things that we do wrong. When we mistreat somebody, when a father misses the mark and mistreats his children, 
and advances in age and feels regret for the things he has done, the guilt and the shame. When he sees little kids running around and he feels remorse and he wants to try to go back in time and do it all over again, but there's no way to do that. Pain, regret weighs us down. It can lead people to commit suicide. It can lead people to take their lives or consider taking their lives. It's a heavy weight. And the Bible shows us in Isaiah 53, 6, that all of us, like sheep, have strayed away from God. We have left God's path to follow our own. And notice, yet the Lord laid on Jesus the sins of us all. All of us carry a weight of sin. We have lived in a fallen world. Romans 5.12 says that when Adam sinned in the garden, sin entered the world, and Adam's sin brought death, and death spread to everyone. So everyone has sinned. Ever since that first couple, when they disobeyed God, God designed them not to endure pain, not to endure grief. God designed you and us not to be experiencing any sort of pain and grief. That's why it's so hard to live on planet Earth. Because ever since the first couple sinned against God, that perfect order was broken. The relationship between Adam and Eve was broken. The first feeling that came into the garden was fear. They were ashamed of God. They noticed they were naked. They were afraid. And life all of a sudden became burdensome. And it became hard and trust was broken. And we were not made or built to endure pain. That was not God's original plan. But when we disobeyed Him, that plan was broken. And life became difficult. There was a curse that came upon the earth and upon humankind. That's why you and I suffer and cry. Because there is sin and death in this world and it entered through the garden it wasn't God's plan pain was not God's plan it was the fruit of our disobedience so many times we are angry at the Lord angry at God why did this happen why is this going on why is my life so difficult why am I ending my life so alone it should not end that way why are things going so bad because sin entered the world Death entered the world, and that sabotaged God's plan. And we are prone now to wonder. We sin against each other. We are afraid. We have to protect one another. We have to jockey ourselves for position because we rebelled against that perfect order. Father and son were broken. The relationship was broken. And we are here, stuck in this world with grief and pain and the weight of it in our lives but the good news for everyone that's hearing here the gospel of Jesus says that Jesus carried upon his own body at that cross the weight of all our sins no wonder there was an earthquake on planet earth because at that moment you and I who had sin against God he took compassion of us and placed on Jesus the weight of all our iniquity, the weight of all our sin, the weight of all our shame. And just like a judge is ready to make sentence, instead of him falling on you and judging you, he picks up his hammer as the righteous, divine, eternal judge of the universe, and he drives it down with all its strength upon his son Jesus, and the earth shakes. When Jesus dies, right at that moment, Jesus is absorbing the pain, the suffering, the sin of the whole world upon his body. And he dies. Jesus paid for the sins of the earth. Every time that we suffer, it's a remembrance that this world is not our home. Every time you experience pain, it should be a reminder that this world should not be the place where we put our hope into. 
It's broken. It's falling. And God is on its way to completely restore it by creating a whole new world order when he comes back, like the Bible says. In the meantime, though, God has promised that those who put their trust in Jesus Christ, even though there is pain in the world and there will continue to be pain in the world, when he enters to live in your life by you turning and trusting in him, this mighty God of the universe brings order inside of your chaos to heal you, to make you whole, to restore peace in the midst of chaos. So yes, the storms might come and they might be around us, but if you are trusting in Jesus, they should not come through you in such a way that it destroys you because he came here to save us from the power of sin and death. And if you open your heart today, and not just on Easter or Christmas morning, but you say, I want you, Jesus, to forgive my sins. If my sins were placed on you and you paid for them, I do not want to carry them anymore. And there is a way out. All you need to do is ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. And just like the Bible promised, he laid on Jesus the sins of us all. You put him on him, he will take care of them. And instead of your sin, he will give you his righteousness. He will give you his peace. He will give you his hope. He will give you his Holy Spirit. And he'll put it right inside of your heart so that the prince of peace and power will be right inside of you in the midst of this fallen world. You can walk and you can live with the assurance that one day you will be home with him and you have a forced foretaste inside of you of that glory yet to come. If you keep reading on Isaiah, you will notice, though, that the sins that we committed caused grief in Jesus Christ. Every time that you and I sin, every time that you and I think or do or have a bad attitude, every sin continually 24-7 is hurting the Father, hurting God deeply. If you're a parent and if you've ever experienced rebellion in your child or in your teenager, if you've ever experienced rebellion in a son or a daughter, you know the pain that a mother feels and a father feels when a son turns their back on you and they turn a cold shoulder to your love. Nothing hurts more than the pain of a rebellious child who sins against you. And God from heaven receives every sin we commit and hurts him deeply. It offends him deeply. It causes him to turn his face from us. It separates us from God. Sin separates us from God. You might believe in God, but if your sins are still in you and on you, you still have a broken relationship with your father. And the only way you can restore relationship with a rebellious son is when that rebellious son chooses to turn from their rebellion and knocks on your door and says, Mom, Dad, I'm sorry for being a brat. I'm sorry for not recognizing the love you gave me. Forgive me. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. Would you take me in again? When a son turns, when a son repents, the father embraces and relationship is restored. You cannot have relationship with a rebellious child. And we have all straight away. The Bible says that we have all straight away like sheep. We've done our own thing. And the Lord laid on Jesus Christ the weight of our own sins so that we would not have to die. And in Gal Galatians 3.13 you will see what God does with our sin. <clears throat> the only way, I don't, I don't want you to miss this because this is very key for you to understand how to have a good relationship with God. He knows you have sinned. He knows you've rebelled against Him. He knows you've turned your back on Him. And instead of Him using that against you, 
The way that God resolves the argument of your offense against him, notice, is he clears it. He resets it. Completely wipes it away. Husbands and wives, if you're having conflict on your relationship, the only way that you will overcome that conflict is not paying for counseling for months and years, trying to figure out who did what, when, and where, and what they said, and no, you got it wrong. It was not that way. It was this way, and you said this, and you said that. As long as we keep still referring to the record of wrongs that we have committed against each other, there will be absolutely no chance for redemption and forgiveness and reconciliation. The only way that an offended party can restore relationship with the one who offended him is when the offended party is willing to forgive the offense and clear it completely. And that's exactly what God did with us. He did not use your sins against you. God was so amazingly full of grace and mercy that he looked at it. He could have used it against it, but he wiped it. He ignored it. He forgave it. He cleansed it. But in order to cleanse it, somebody needed to pay for those sins. And he took it upon himself to pay for the things that you and I committed. Have you ever been blamed for something you did not do? Have you ever been falsely accused? Have you ever been slandered? Have your, have your name been brought down to the floor because somebody hated you, was envious of you, and started talking about you, and they destroyed your reputation with a little blog on Facebook or on Twitter, and that's it? Your life is over by what they said? Doesn't it stink? Doesn't it want to make you rise up and demand justice? And get the record straight. Well, God did not do that with you and I. God completely took all the blame upon himself. And he did nothing wrong. He was perfect. The only, only human being who would never sin was Jesus. If there was anybody who had the right to shove it on our faces. And to make justice was him. But he chose not to do it. That is what amazes me. That is what has made me fall in love with God. We serve a God. That while we were still sinners, he loved us in Jesus Christ and he died and he paid for your and my sin. To God be the glory for what he's done for us. What kind of God is this that has so much amplitude in his heart to be able to endure and absorb all that pain and not even open his lips to, the, to defend himself? That is the God that we serve. It's an awesome God. Therefore, the pain that came upon him made a way for you and I to be whole and healed. Isaiah 53, 4a says, It was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. This was a prophecy from prophet Isaiah 700 years before it even happened. And so many other prophecies. This is just one example. The crucifixion of Jesus prophesied by Isaiah saying, our weaknesses he carried. Our sorrows, sorrows weighed him down. Weaknesses is a synonym of sicknesses. So he felt sickness at the cross in his body. Have, have you ever been sick? Have you ever felt ailment in your body? Jesus knows exactly how it feels. It might, not, it might not take that away from you all the time. You know, there's a lot of people in the world who are disabled, who have no arms and legs. And does that mean that Jesus is going to make legs grow for them? If we promise that that's what God's going to do all the time, we will give people a lot of false hope that in the end would turn them against God because he didn't deliver what people said he would do for you. But what this says is, he carried your weaknesses, your sickness. In other words, he knows exactly how you feel when you're sick. That's good to know. Because even if God chooses not to restore you for whatever divine plan he has, which he has the power to heal you completely, at least you know that somebody understands what you feel. He understands. He carried your sorrows. Sorrows is the word that refers to mental and physical pain. Have you ever experienced 
mental pain, like you're about to lose your mind? Have you ever experienced a hell inside of your soul? Have you ever experienced like you just want to run and shut the whole world or just be done with it altogether? Jesus carried that sorrow as well. The worst day of your life, Jesus knows how it feels. The worst day of everybody's lives, Jesus knows how it feels. He took it upon himself all at the same time in one instant in time. And the earth shook. It was an earthquake that led him. His death led to that earthquake, which shows the weight that came upon his life. Later, Isaiah 53, 5a, notice what it says. It was, he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sin. Rebellion is the word transgression. It's an act that goes against the law of God. It can be in the form of a thought, an attitude, a word, a deed, or even an omission. It says that he was pierced for my rebellion. Okay? Think about being unjustly accused. You are paying the consequences for somebody else's sin. How many people are today innocent in death row? How many people have been released from prison after 40 plus years? And they say, oops, sorry, a uh, mistake. Science has evolved. We have proof of DNA that it wasn't you. You're free to go. You want a hamburger? Maybe some chicken nuggets? That's not fair. It's unjust. I mean, hello. He was pierced. He was killed. He suffered for your rebellion, for my rebellion. What kind of God is this that loves us so deeply? Do you understand? Why do you run away from the one who died for your sins? Why would you not want to have a relationship with a God who took your pain in mind and paid for it so that you and I could be set free from the power of sin. No one should in his right mind forsake such a savior. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with deep grief. He was crushed by our sins. Sin is depravity. If you look at it in the dictionary, sin is depravity, moral corruption. The Bible says that we all have done it, all of us here. Compared to the standard of God, we are corrupted. We are depraved in his eyes. That's how he sees us. But when he sees us through Jesus, he sees us fully approved, fully sanctified in his eyes. He was the scapegoat that delivered us from our sins. So in Jesus Christ, I can stand before God completely innocent free from any sin, free from any transgression for the rest of my life. It doesn't move me to want to sin, but it moves me to want to please Him out of gratitude for what He has done. That's the difference between religion and relationship. Religion is you trying to earn brownie points with God, trying to do best and better each time. Relationship is he already did it for you. He paid the price for you. He took upon himself the curse of the law, which is death. And he gave me his life. All I need to do is turn to him, trust him, receive it, and enjoy the ride until I see him face to face. How many of you give him glory for his work at the cross? I want you to now go back in time to that moment when Jesus died. And then I'm going to take you to the resurrection. And we're going to take a little bit of time to pray for one another. Because I believe there are people today here who God has brought as a divine appointment to bring you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's very simple. God died for your sins. On the third day, he rose back from the dead. And whoever believes in his heart that Jesus is Lord and confesses that God raised him from the dead, that he is the Lord of your life, he will save you. He will save you. And he will place his Holy Spirit in you. Close to 3 o'clock on Good Friday. I'm going to sing a song now. And I want you to imagine your sin, your particular sin, not your friend's sin, not your neighbor's sin, 
but your own sin, your offense, being placed on him. You are that sheep that's straight away. And this is what God did to bring you back. Like a lamb to the slaughter, they led him away. They beat him, scorned and bruised him for the sheep that gone astray. He was a man of sorrows, well acquainted with our grief. He had to die for our sin and unbelief. the scourgings and the beatings he never said a word with a crown of thorns and a purple robe they mocked him as a king no pilot found no fault in him that he should have to die the crowd cried away with him he must be crucified Behold the man Behold the man Though blameless He became the perfect Sacrificial lamb Behold the man Behold the man Really Look at him, and then you'll understand. So many hid their faces, they just could not see. How the Son of God could be this broken man from Galilee. And still today so many haven't opened up their eyes. For if they'd only look at him, they know that he's the Christ. Amen for his suffering. Hallelujah. And then on that glorious morning, there was silence for three days. Hope was lost. Those that saw him heal the sick and speak words of hope saw him die and bleed to death and they said truly was he really who he said he was 
Why didn't he defend himself? Why didn't he cry out for angels to help him? He looked so weak, so disfigured, so helpless. Some would say so pathetic. If he's God, save himself. Let him call his father to save him. Silence. Devastation. Those who loved him had lost hope. That earthquake just led to hopelessness. A whole Saturday, no news about him. The stone still rolled over the tomb. And it was Sabbath. Nobody could move. It was a day of rest. But early in the morning, women. Oh, God bless the women who have such a deep devotion for the Lord Jesus. God bless the women. The first ones to go and check the tomb. To prepare his body. And then all of a sudden, another earthquake hits planet Earth. Something is going on inside of that tomb. The very power of God, the very power of the Holy Spirit enters that grave, penetrates through the rock. See, many think that the rock was removed so that Jesus could come out. He did not need the rock to be removed. All he needed was the breath of the Spirit in him. He began to move his fingers, his toes. Nobody had seen him yet, but life hit a dark place, a hopeless place. And the earthquake that ushered demise and brokenness now continues by ushering the life-giving power of heaven right into earth. For the first time in the history of humankind, the Holy Spirit is bringing somebody from the dead and that person would never ever die again. Yes, people have been risen by Jesus, Lazarus, but he died again. But this was the first time and the only time when one who has been dead is now alive at one and will never die again. And the earth shakes. The angel comes down. He rolls the stone. The soldiers are afraid. They fall into a faint. And the girls come in to see the empty tomb. He'd come out. The crucifixion open tombs and the resurrection empties the tombs he's out and about and the bible says that still those who believe in jesus christ will experience the groanings of a fallen world and the pain of the world however the same giving spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is promised to be given to every follower and of Jesus Christ so that when you die you can also live like he did and experience eternal life forever and ever with him never to perish ever in a place of torment and separation from God he rose from the dead and if you trust in him like the Bible says we were dead because of our sins and because of our sinful nature was not yet cut away then God made us alive with Christ for he forgave our sins he canceled the record of the charges against us and took away it took away took it away by nailing it to the cross and in this way notice he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. That means that Jesus did not just die to carry your sins and your sorrows. That's good, but that's not enough. If the enemy wanted to kill you, and to keep you in a prison of torment forever because he would want to see you die with your offenses against God. If he would still be able to do that, even though Jesus died, then there was no victory whatsoever. But when Jesus 
was able to take from the enemy the weapons against us, the arguments against us, the accusing arguments to bring us down. In that moment, he is able to give us overwhelming victory forever and ever. A terrorist can still hurt you even if somebody takes the blow for you. A terrorist can only be overcome when all his weapons are taken away from him and he has nothing to use against you. Jesus, by his resurrection, did not take away the pain in the world, did not take away the sorrow of the world, but he did put his spirit in those who accept him to eliminate and heal the pain inside of that heart and anyone who receives him. When you and I place our trust in Jesus Christ, the earthquake of hopelessness is transferred into an explosion of hope and life and makes you want to live for the glory of God all the days of your life. Romans 8, 23 says, We believers also groan, and even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foreshade of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. You and I long that. And the only way you and I can escape that is by receiving the same power that Jesus received when he rose from the dead. My question to you, do you have the Holy Spirit in you? Do you have the Spirit that is able to bring you back from the dead, that is able to roll that stone that keeps you in the grave. If you have them, you have the certainty of heaven, of that future glory that we so long inside of us. And every time we experience pain, that nerve and that desire of restoration is a reminder. I'm not yet there, but I will be someday. And thanks to God for his Holy Spirit, I have a foretaste and a hope that one day I'm going to be with Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Are you glad about this hope? If you have this hope, church, I want you to clap as loud as you can and thank Jesus for the gift of life, for he overtook the power of hell by his resurrection from the dead at the cross of Calvary. We have defeated because you defeated the grave, Lord. We thank you. I want you to please stand on your feet. And I want to ask every person this morning whose shame and whose weight of sin is still weighing upon you. And you know that you need a touch from God. And all he's asking is, come, come to me. For I rose to give you the victory. I rose to give you hope. I rose so that you can wake up tomorrow and know that you are mine. You belong to me. You will not die in your sins. You will not be separated from me. You are with me. I've adopted you. You will be with me forever. And that restoration that you long in the inside will soon come to pass when I bring you into my house, heaven forever and ever for all of those who have accepted him as their Savior and Lord. Ask him today, Lord Forgive me of my sins. I acknowledge I've sinned against you. And he will save you today. If that's you, you need to be saved. You need to come to Jesus. Or you need God to heal your heart, the pain in your heart. I want to invite all of you, maybe you brought a friend, to just simply make your way here to the altar at the front as we wait in, in singing and in prayer. And we're going to have people praying for you all over this building just to be with you. To so pray for the overwhelming power of God to penetrate your life, to penetrate your tomb, your life, and shatter the rocks that are holding you captive this evening. Let's pray and let's sing. And as we sing, feel free to respond and to come to Jesus Christ. Have your way, Lord, in this place and resurrect us from the dead. This is the day of the Lord.
give us, Lord, your victory today. In Jesus' name. Gracias, Señor. His precious blood was for communion. God wanted closeness again. Come close to Him, church. All of our chains broken on the day the heroes celebrate the day the heroes. There's power in the way the heroes. Bless His holy name. Yeah, he runs. When Jesus died, it was for our freedom, breaking the bondage of sin. to come if a friend wants to come up ask a friend that you brought do you want to come up do you want to receive prayer just let the Lord touch you God's working that you have given fresh hope and life to us you're here today and you know you know that God brought you here he brought you here to seal with him a relationship with God I'm going to ask for a few minutes that if you have a person next to you maybe a loved one that you brought you take a few minutes to just pray with one another and pray with them that the Lord Jesus Christ will be enthroned in everyone's heart and that no one, not one person today would ever have to wonder if there's forgiveness, if there's redemption, if there's victory in Jesus because there is and it's available to us today, right now. 
go ahead and pray for somebody. serve an awesome God. He stands for us. He will never leave us, never abandon us. If this is your first time to Lifeway, we hope that you can come next Sunday. And we want to help you develop a strong relationship with Jesus Christ. There's going to be some refreshments on the foyer. Some empanadas are on their way. They're not quite here, but they're in their way. They're going to be hot and warm and, and ready to go. So if you can linger a little bit, there's going to be some food for our stomachs. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. Make his, uh, may His uh, face shine upon you and make you strong and fill you with His peace. God bless you. Give God thanks for His goodness today. Amen.
God bless you. You are dismissed.